Um, I'll begin by expressing my gratitude to the Indic Academy and Nand Kumar ji, Muthuraman ji and everybody else uh, associated with this forum because they gave me an, my fanboy moment and I met um, Vivek Agnihotri and also met some of my old friends here. What I'm going to discuss now is divided into three parts. In the first part, which I will be using as an entry point for an engagement with some other larger issues. So that will be about the book. The second part will be about my own journey, my own experience with what Vivek ji calls urban nuxels. And in the third part, we will try to try, not exactly to find answers because it's very difficult. We are still grappling with that issue. As to why do they do what they do? So let me begin with the book. If you Google Buddha in a traffic jam, immediately you are bombarded with some very violent language. That this movie makes me feel pity for the Indian right. This could have been better avoided, this and that. And Vivekji is courageous enough to have directly engaged and confronted that, those types of reviews in his book, towards the end of the book. So I was actually wondering as to why this violence? Why they are so defensive? Then I understood that maybe they are being exposed. Because we, whether it is the people associated with media, academics, cultural producers, quote unquote, the, those who produce culture, we are the ones actually who write about others. Usually we are the ones who are the subjects of knowledge. We write about others, we make the issues known. So for us, the difference is very clear. We are the subjects of knowledge, others, Dalits, subalterns, women, tribals, they are the objects of knowledge. And their salvation lies when they are written about by us. The moment somebody reverses the pyramid, as your friend Prasun Joshi advised you to do, <laughs> so then we suddenly realize, somebody shows the mirror to us, then we realize that, okay, so that distinction is very sticky. And the moment we try to become an object of knowledge in our own writings, at times it is very mutually uh, uh, admiration kind of society, where we usually say that Mr. X has produced wonderful work so that, that Mr. X can cite my work in his papers, I will cite his papers saying that he has done your man's job and this and that. But actually how do we look like to people outside? So this no particular text, this particular narrative, is a very, very courageous text and it articulates that particular, it, it, it betrays, it exposes the fear of those intellectuals who suddenly feel that their ground of being, the ground under their feet is slipping. That is why suddenly we realize that now we have nothing to cling on to. Okay? Because so far we have said that we are our, your emancipators. Now suddenly people realize that we are no longer emancipators, we have our own hidden agenda we need this grant, that grant, so that's why we have to do certain things that our donors want us to hear. So that is why we usually get a little defensive and that is what happened when you Google Buddha in a traffic jam. It is not a popcorn movie. You can't really relax and watch. In the first decade of, or the second or third decade of 20th century, there was a dramatist called Antonin Arto, a director as well. So he introduced this idea called theater of cruelty. The cruelty is actually to the audience. The audience must be really subjected to some sort of cruelty. Usually the audience sits in the middle and the stage revolves around them and they have to really crane their neck and look this way, that way, what is happening. So this way, in actually, in a more or less, it is actually a kind of text, a kind of narrative which tortures you. Tortures you not in a very negative sense. Okay, it, it basically forces you to think. It's very provocative that way. And I would like to request Vivek Ji, I'm sure he is a smart guy, he knows it already, that he doesn't have to lose heart, what others say about that. Like your drama, your, your movie is experimental, both in the text, both in the content, and also in the way it is represented, like a book chapter and so on. So suddenly the Marxist critics realize that here is something which doesn't directly engage with quote-unquote social issues, and hence it's a threat. And the official Writers' Congress in Moscow in 1934, 
officially declared this book as a as a pit of dung crawling with worms okay because they because they, they realize that this is not for us you defy our position on certain things then we will call you names so that is why i think many of these people suddenly got exposed and then they start started writing about the the both the the film and i am sure they will start writing soon about the book and it is provocative both in content and and the presentation as i said both the film and the book i would like to believe belong to a genre called bildungs roman the narrative of growth okay they are vikram pandit both of them start with v vikram pandit and vivek agnihotri okay so both of them they go through a kind of self discovery and self discovery is a very painful process in the process you lose many things you lose the admiration appreciation friendship of many but at the end of it you also gain a lot but more importantly you gain knowledge the last couple of lines i would like to read in from this book a few lines this is page 369 i am so grateful to the invisible power viewers supporters politicians activists critics media trolls and the intellectuals for richly contributing to my life changing experience i am not the same person anymore today i don't fear losing anything i fear no one not out of arrogance but because of my complete surrender and surrendering to the principle that eventually only truth wins satya me bajayate because of my realization that no sacrifice is as valuable as the discovery of truth this is the victory of buddha that is what i am talking about this is an attempt in self discovery and vivek agni sorry uh, vikram pandit is his alter ego in the movie both of them are continuously evolving and discovering themselves their hopes their fears and at the end of it it's all about finding your sur finding sur is very important i will tell you when vivek ji found his sur that is on the on the road to jaipur in that in the middle of nowhere in that rice field he suddenly goes through that moment of epiphany i'll tell you when i found my epiphany a little later so the moment of recognition or aristotle calls it anagnorisis when the cub wave of confusion leads to knowledge but knowledge comes at the loss of innocence what we don't have to really worry about it the book is riveting it will keep you spellbound you just it's unput downable and the last time i read that kind of book was long long ago 10 years ago which is godfather so i <laughs> i i don't read uh, novels unfortunately so i read this book from cover to cover after a long time and i started it and i finished it and it took me two days so it is full of intensity like eliot would have said it's also full of spontaneity as wordsworth would have said in many places it's pure poetry it's almost a kind of reverie where vivek ji traverses both the present and the past almost a kind of phantasmagoria but you actually at times feel really very sorry for vivek ji at times i i have also lived and died thousand times while reading this book okay because it is in a way in many ways it is also close to my own evolution and in in tamil nadu as we say a pavam so i feel like <laughs> vivek ji is a pavam okay so it's a damn courageous book and let me tell you that you need gods and intestines to write this kind of book and you need even stronger gods and stronger intestines to take it to the dens of those people who opposed you okay my tamil is very limited but i am reminded of that rajnikanth dialogue panni kutama barum singam singla bar okay. so as as i was reading his experience in yadavpur university in in hyderabad and in many other places i was thinking of this dialogue she explained that uh, dialogue okay madam you can you can do that a little little maybe better so so basically it's the it's the singer it's, it's the lion who usually goes alone and so the question is why did vivek ji do that why did he really take that kind of risk taking the risk losing friends okay it is something which requires a lot of conviction he did this because he had to do this somebody had to do this 
everybody appreciates buddha but very few people actually want buddha to be born in their own home because nobody wants his son to go away that's the fact okay i i want my daughter to be with me all the time so it you, you need a lot of conviction you need a lot of passion and you must exactly know what you want what you expect from life and i read my books very seriously usually and and i usually mark it with pencil vigorously that's why my friend sonu that doesn't like me because i usually soil her books but one day what i was doing is i travel these days quite a lot and i was traveling and i was reading this book i was marking it and uh, the flight attendant came near me and uh, as i was collecting my plate i had to close this book and she saw the the title she came back after 5 minutes and said can i take this i said no i can't part with this she said no i'll return it to you after 15 minutes she takes it and she returned it to me definitely after 15 20 minutes she said i couldn't read it i could read about a couple of pages and i'm going to buy one copy and read it that is i, I knew that that what the girl was saying is a superficial understanding maybe only she was attracted by the cover page or something but i also had reasons to believe that there is an instant connect immediately this irreverent title that immediately forces you to think something that there is something which is not usually visible to the naked eye so there is something very very captivating about this book not just merely in the title but also with the process of establishing the peddlers of intellect the intellectuals i call them actually there is no there is no regional language which is equivalent to intellectual you can you can call them buddhi ebi or something of that kind which means which basically uses his buddhi as a profession or something okay we, we don't have really any vernacular word which is quite similar to intellectual so it's basically a peddler of intellect or mercenary as i as i believe so you need a lot of courage to call them as urban naxals the recent arrest of uh, soma sen in the bhima koregaon case that establishes what you have been arguing whether it is sundar whether it is sai baba and so on so i am sure this expression urban naxals will become a category of analysis and a template to describe these elitist intellectuals <laughs> hell bent on destroying indian state its democracy and its people the term will be a rallying expression for all those who think differently particularly those who respect people's sentiment and respect their ways of understanding the world and i believe that this particular title and the expression urban naxals will continue to haunt the intellectuals both h a u n t and h u n t okay and i believe that there remains that is the strength of that book and i can clearly see a couple of nasty reviews very soon i am sure you are prepared for it and i am also sure that there will also be some sensible critique of it which is which is very neutral and not necessarily a criticism second part is my own evolution it's a little dramatic not as dramatic as vivek ji's i was told i mean this is this is almost a truism that if you are under 25 and not a communist you have no heart but if you are over 25 and still a communist you have no mind <laughs> okay so this is something for me it took a little longer it was not necessarily 25 for me it took another 5 years or so so that break came for me around 30 or 32 something like that so i believe that this is equally my story it is a story of many young men many young women who actually sacrificed their aspirations for some imaginary quote on quote cause when i was growing up in the hinterlands of odisha i i come from a village which until recently didn't have electricity my village my my district still doesn't have a rail line i come from kendrapara district of odisha which doesn't have a train line the nearest railway station is in another district and we had a teacher a literature professor and i am reminded of your teacher you didn't name him i will also not name him so he came and he taught wordsworth he taught uh, eliot he taught many other things but in between he also taught us about revolution 
and he spoke about poor people and how they have been disenfranchised. And at that time, our stakes were very low because we came from very ordinary backgrounds. Our stakes are low. We, don't, we, didn't, we didn't have any st stable understanding of what a future actually holds in store. Yogi Berra once said, future is no longer as interesting as it used to be. So future was never interesting for us. So our teacher provided us a cause to do something. And we started doing it. I don't have to tell you what we did. Many of us joined many of those forces that you have written about. Fortunately, for me, I escaped because we had another professor who came, his name was Subhas Sahu. He actually successfully convinced us that future lies in building your own career. You first make your own career and then think of others, then think of helping others. You be in a position to help others, not necessarily now, by sacrificing your own career. And his narrative was more credible. Those who didn't believe him joined to the other side. Many of them are still our farm laborers. And, and they were actually better students than me, but they ended up as something else. Around 30 or so, I entered into the world of academia. Then I call it the academic underworld. And in this academic underworld, there is no ethics. Mostly, my colleagues not may not necessarily agree with me, but here I am not creating a theory. I'm, my sample size is very small, and, and I speak mostly about the kind of people I deal with, not necessarily engineers and scientists. And when I joined my, this department, I, I came across many poets, many revolutionary thinkers, and I was instantly attracted to them because they were almost sage-like and uh, they, they had, they always uttered pulse of wisdom. Their control over language was great and at times baffling. Half the time I didn't even understand what they said. And then I thought it must be great. We had our former director, Professor M.S. Anand, used to say that when you go to the class, you teach in a way that 33% of what you say is understood to everybody. 33% is understood by a few, but not by everybody. And the rest 33% must not be understood by anybody. <laughs> In the publisher Paris climate, I came to see that all those super intellectuals, those who are trying to guide me or slot me in a particular template, I realized that they actually, they, ha they are nowhere close to that. Unfortunately, I saw that I don't, I didn't, I, I don't have to really learn a, much, a lot from them. And and then I started questioning them, that as to why, how come you have spoken so nicely, so eloquently about what constitutes transparency, what constitutes the responsibility or the social commitment of a teacher, then where is the record, where is the proof? You must have some record of some solid scholarly publication. And I'm still struggling to find, and they have yet not come with an answer. When but that is, my disillusionment had not come. I was still writing in the same mold. That 25 break had not yet come to me. And I, I wrote about uh, terrorism and I, I, I spoke about it as how it is a construct. It is just a construct. It's not a tangible reality. It's only a product of a particular type of analysis. And everybody liked it. It was immediately published and it went to the, the it formed the part of in many university syllabuses also. But now they, don't, no, they no longer take me seriously because I don't write about those things anymore. So what happened? My transition came on a particular day. There is a particular kind of study circle in our institute. I don't have to name it. And they put a huge poster on the way to my department. One day I, say, I saw that how Hindus are bestial, they are beastly, and how it has to be completely destroyed if any semblance of social equality has to be ensured. It was quite shocking to me. I thought this is something that we cannot accept. A little bit of criticism, a little bit of self-doubt, a little bit of self-reflexivity comes naturally to me and I think it comes naturally to every other academic. We, are always, have, we always have a self-doubt. But this is something which is, which is, it's not a question of toleration anymore. So then I expressed my displeasure with a few people, but then immediately they could not take it because I was still part of that league and they could not take it that I'm questioning this. Then they realized that maybe I'm slowly becoming an outlier and slowly perhaps I will drift away. 
that was the first time that I, my first brush with these pehardars or the intellectual mercenaries. Interestingly, they also like, they call you the, the bloody fascist Brahmin, go back. Uh, nobody has exactly expressed the, exact the same um, expression, but many of them have also more or less something similar, I have also been told, that you have to start, stop talking about all these issues because you have no business to talk about many things. And those people who actually questioned me for being both a Brahmin and Brahminical, I don't know how I became Brahminical, but yes, Brahmin, yes, I am. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I have no control over it. So, <laughs> the ones who questioned me, unfortunately, they were all Brahmins. <laughs> and and, and they, they were the chairpersons of different types of study circles. This bar, that bar, this circle, that circle, they were all Brahmins. Okay? And, and these Brahmins who asked me to fall in line, they, I, I repeat, they had no proven scholarship, record of scholarship to actually establish that they should be taken seriously. Then last year, a type of festival came, B festival as you know it. Some of the intellectual mercenaries again spearheaded it. I'm from Odisha and in Odisha we worship cows. And Raksya Bandhan, in Odisha Raksya Bandhan means tying the Rakhi to the cow, on the cow's horn, usually, because they protect us. I am a person who is unnecessarily not going to bother about somebody's food habit. If somebody is eating something next to me, I have no problem. As long as he's not put, if he doesn't put it on my plate, it's fine. But when you organize a particular event with the sole intention of outraging somebody's religious belief, it is no longer about freedom of her food. I have also written about it in some places. If you actually see, if the videos are available, if you see those videos, you will see that before eating, they are saying, Gaumata, Gaumata. Okay? It's basically deliberately trying to outrage somebody's belief. It's not about food. So that was another event which actually forced me to think my being in this intellectual universe. A little before that, and, and I wanted to write about it. And one particular newspaper said that, yes, I sent a, paper, I, I sent a write up saying, telling them about the other side of all these things that whatever I told you. They said, yes, yes, it will be published. Seven days went past, they didn't publish. And then later on, they informed me that this is the editorial policy is that we don't unnecessarily publish complicated things. I said, you, but you have already published that how this has been a fight over uh, freedom over food. But anyway, I never heard from them. Then at that time, I came in contact with uh, Amarji, Amar uh, Govindrajan, from some contact. And then they published, and that was a rebuttal, at another side of that particular story. A little before that, there was a particular event called Pellets in Paradise. A particular movie which was screened and in that particular movie, it was shown how, and the, and the speaker who introduced the movie said that this is the authentic expression of the oppressed. At times we use some selective phrases. Uh, so, uh, and another phrase my colleague, my learned colleague used is the banality of evil. That how, and many a time they don't even understand half of them because they don't read. And, and just because Hannah Arendt said this, and Hannah Arendt said this in what context? Was she talking about India? Was Heidegger talking about India? Okay, at times we get a little carried away. Anyway, so in this particular movie, when the, there are a few scenes when the Indian national tricolor is being born, being trampled, and which is being celebrated as the authentic expression of the marginalized, then I thought I should question. And it was definitely not a very pleasant uh, scenario. My friend uh, is smiling. So he was there all along, Benki. And, and uh, in that particular cacophony, when I questioned them, and one colleague of mine got so worked up that he started photograph videographing me, 
saying that now this is a classic case where I must take this to my democracy class so that I can tell them how people should behave in public sphere. I still work with my that colleague of mine. He still smiles at me, though I'm not very sure whether he used those that video in the class or not. So, uh, so in that particular moment, when I was questioning them while being booed, I had the moment of realization. Like that moment of realization in the rice field, in that dark night, you don't know where exactly you are going. My moment of recognition came at that moment that I am going to challenge these people. <clears throat> there is no more humiliating feeling than being booed by your students, the very students who you teach in a regular class. I don't think anybody will, I, I pray that nobody should be subjected to that kind of experience. And I got my sur during those moments. I knew my future. And I knew that I will expose the hypocrisy of my colleagues. And I will also spend time with my students who want to connect rather than destroy, those who want to create rather than destroy, how to hope and love rather than to fear, rather than to express hatred. And after that, I have got tremendous support from many of my colleagues. I'll take a couple of more minutes in the last part, which is called, why do they do what they do? There is no definitive answer for this. This is a very open-ended question. And, and as intellectuals say, we have to only raise a few questions. We don't have to find answers. Madam has already expressed that in very eloquently, of course. At times, I really worry whether our whole higher education complex is all about training students to ask questions, but never to find answers. It's a very expensive affair, actually. <laughs> Just imagine university, running universities only to teach students how to ask questions or to express dissent. I'm not very sure whether that is the right approach. Anyway, so there is no definitive answer, but the first possible answer is they are also poems. They know no better. Okay? They are ignorant. They suffer from a false consciousness. The Christian missionaries in the beginning said a particular, created a particular type of understanding of India. Then colonialists came, extended that same mm -hmm. argument that it's, it's just a merely geographical expression and it will crumble under its own contradictions, under its own weight. It's just a matter of time. And then after that, our post-colonial education has actually not been decolonized. We still suffer from colonial consciousness. If you really want to know, get into the heart of things, I strongly recommend a book called Reconceptualizing India Studies. It's written by S. N. Balagangadhar, who is a professor of philosophy at Ghent in Belgium. Not many people know this book because he doesn't belong to that cabal. Okay? So, this is one expression. One explanation that maybe they just they are they just don't know, and many a time Chetan Bhagat has used a very interesting phrase called virtue signaling. Everybody, I'm sure, all academics, particularly in humanities and social sciences, maybe more, maybe in sciences and engineering, must have experienced this virtue signaling. What is that? When you go to a conference, when you get introduced to somebody else, that somebody else asks you, "Okay, Professor Tripathi, what is your impression of Modi government?" I said, no, the, the, the conference is on cultural elites. It's, it's not about contemporary politics. But that happens. Why? They want you to respond in a particular manner, and then they know whether you belong to that club or not. It's called virtue signaling. Okay? It's a very interesting expression. And I have actually been virtue signaled by many times by many of my friends, both my Odia tribe friends and non-Odia tribe friends also. And, and the second explanation is, that actually they know what they are doing. They know that they are articulating absolutely untrue, half-true, half-baked things. But it pays to speak untruth. It is rewarding to speak untruth. Publication industry, which I have already just now said, which is a mutual admiration society. I will say, Vivekji's work is great. He will say that my work is great and so on. My student will quote him, his students will quote me. My citation index will go up and so on. So scholarships, fellowships, foreign travel, free alcohol, <laughs> followed by some very substantive nocturnal, other nocturnal activities, 
Vivekji has spoken about that in one of his chapters. Like you, I can also smell them. The moment they get in the dinner table, I immediately smell what the next conversation is going to lead. And I know what is the next stop for them. So that is the second explanation, that it pays. You can actually get your work published. You can get all sorts of grants. You can get fellowship. It's very easy to be a chairman of this board, that board, and so on. Okay? So that is why. And all the foreign funding, whether it is any kind of foreign funding. Again, I don't want to take, because many of my friends are also beneficiaries. I don't want to unnecessarily complicate things. So including me, by the way. So, so what happens is that they want to hear you, hear from you, a particular idea of India. And if you are subscribing to that template, then you are a scholar. If you are questioning that template, you are not a scholar. At times, I really wonder how I have survived. I, I still have got a, a few publications here and there. I still don't know how. I still get published. Earlier, it was a little easier. So what happens is this particular climate has created a, a climate where very mediocre people can actually pass off as scholars. You don't need decades of dedication to study a particular text, a particular tradition. All you need is a smattering of theory. Politics of representation is one such expression. Okay? The politics of the governed, another expression. Okay. So I, I, can, I can go on. And uh, so if you use some of these very, very strategically, then you can get published. You can also be very successful academic. That is second reason, material reason. The third reason, this is the last, which is that intellectuals and academics in particular, because I'm giving a ringside view of things, okay? because I'm an insider. <laughs> intellectuals and academics are actually attention hungry. Okay? They need attention all the time. Everybody may not agree with me, but it mostly. It is like Sigmund Freud spoke about the child in the oral stage. The child's proper fulfillment comes when the need of a child is fulfilled by the mother even before the child asks for it. Before the child is hungry, the mother must understand the child is hungry. Intellectuals are more or less like that. Okay? Their needs must be fulfilled, they must be pampered, they must be told that, look, you are the ones for which democracy survives. You are the ones who are actually the basuki nag, carrying on your shoulder the whole universe and so on. Okay? And if that attention can get combined with some award uh, and some free ticket to some foreign shore, then, or some committee chairmanship, uh, then all, even better. And these are the folks who are instrumental, not just in providing a theoretical foundation to mass movements, remember this, but also in actively brainwashing and indoctrinating. And these are the men of words who gave, who give many of these movements a set of spontaneity, a color of spontaneity, which even though when it is actually has been obtained through coercion or indoctrination. They want to project it as spontaneous, but actually it is not spontaneous. It is either a particular kind of very subtle kind of coercion or indoctrination. And that's why if Martin Luther had been given some position of a bishop, perhaps he would not have gone for reformation. If Marx had been given some title in Prussia, he would not have gone to London at all. Okay, forget about writing a book. Okay, so that is why Napoleon once famously remarked that it is vanity which starts a revolution. Liberty is only a pretext. Okay. One man is enough. And there are so many disgruntled youth looking for some kind of cause. You can always invent a particular type of cause. How do we address it? In Karate Kid, there is a particular scene, very interesting scene, where the one which is the role which is played by Jackie Chan says to his, to his protege, mind you, there are no bad students. There are only bad teachers. It's a very, very profound statement, I believe. There are, I still believe that there are only bad teachers. Because students' minds are fresh. Okay? They are malleable. They have come for a, for a, with a particular kind of idea about life, with aspiration and everything, and we give them a completely new direction. So how to address this? We, I think we have to create a band of teachers and researchers who will 
replace the old narratives. And these ones must be credible narratives. And these people should lead some universities and some forums, and there should be some forums where actually people can find some place to articulate those alternative ideas. Vivekji, you have already identified the problem through this cult movie. This is no mean task. Let us all contribute to that particular movement which you have started in recent times. Let us ask our students that time is ripe for the narratives of unity, universality, commonality and aspiration and that future belongs to those who dream and hope. Let us also pray for those academics and intellectuals so that they do not compromise the student's future while enjoying a fat salary. A fat salary, believe me, it's, I get about 2 lakh rupees a month and a five-star lifestyle and that to, only to teach dissent to students, I'm not very sure about that. And if they still don't change, then like Munna Bhai, we can tell them, get well soon. <laughs> so thanks everybody, including my colleagues from IIT for being patient with me. <laughs> and uh, coming on a Sunday, I once again thank uh, Indic Academy, Nand Kumar ji and Muthuram Manji and everybody else, also Mr. Sriram. So thank you very much for your presentation.